Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me and my very special guest. He is one of our favorite stage, screen, and television stars. You know him, oh yes, from such <laughs> musicals as Miss Saigon, The Full Monty, Rent, The Mystery of Edwin Brood, and Kiss Me Kate, and from numerous television shows, including Smash and Nashville. And he has just released his debut short film called Dagger, which he wrote, directed, and filmed by himself in quarantine. And I must say, it is sensational. Oh, Please say hello to my friend, Will Chase. Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you. Good to see you, sir. How are you? I miss you. Oh, my God. I miss everybody, but it's nice to see your face. <laughs> this is so, this is like the new now, and I'm looking at your setup, and I see a camera behind you because now you are a filmmaker, my friend, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a camera there. I've uh, I've gone down the rabbit hole of uh, of uh, buying some, some gear. I've become a gearhead, and this is one, you know, this is one of those... This is one of those things where the more you know, the less you know, because, you know, oh, buy a camera. Now I know nothing about anything. But, yeah, that's a camera right there, yeah. Well, first and of a piano all, where uh, Ingrid writes her some music, too. So there you oh, go. Oh, I love this. I would love – there should be a reality show in no. your home. No, there should not be. <laughs> you filming, Ingrid, you know, writing her compositions. First of all, how are the two of you and where are you? We're in uh, Brooklyn. We're in New York. Oh, great. Uh, we're great. Uh, she's very busy. We're oddly, oddly busy. Uh, for for a while, we weren't. Uh, but, you know, with writers, uh, I'm not one. I don't profess to be one, even though I wrote something. That's a whole lot of the story. But, you know, she can come here and go and she'll kick me out of the office going, um, hey, I need I need to write something real quick. Uh, so and then I'm banished for only only a little while because she writes fast and she plays me a demo. It's like, how did you do that? Whereas I toil and, you know, not her. She goes in there and does her thing. Yeah. So, Will, we are now in our 10th month or coming out of our 10th month since the New York theater shut down. I mean, what were those first few months like for the two of you? Well, we were in L.A. because I had gone out. We had gone out at the beginning of last year for a bit. I had some meetings and some auditions that went well. I, I was going back out by myself to to do some follow up meetings, possibly some pilot stuff. And then Ingrid and a friend were supposed to go to Amsterdam. And this is right the end of February. So it was like, maybe it's not best to travel. Uh, why don't you guys come to LA and we'll see. We'll, we'll just wait it out here. Well, we waited it out there till uh, July the 4th. <laughs> so we were in LA for, the big, for, for it because uh, we have a house there, which was uh, great as far as not feeling like everything was on top of you. You know, you have the air, you have... You could actually walk around and not see people and, you know, that kind of thing. It was just surreal. It was a surreal, as it was for everyone, just a, a surreal time. So now what are these these months like for you now? Uh, these, you know, the, the uh, I guess the, uh, I, I joke in texts when I send people texts going, how are you during these end times? Yeah. Uh, uh, meaning also the current administration that's going bye-bye. Thank you. Um, I think we're doing okay. We, we see a light at the middle of the tunnel, I guess, yep. as it were. Uh, we're doing good. We're, uh, I try, you know, obviously with this, with this movie and everything, I tried to keep myself busy. I wasn't keeping myself busy. I was basically just kind of working out in our makeshift gym in LA and in our garage and watching, you know, TV every night. And then the a spark hit. And then, uh, I was really busy, uh, the rest of the time, which was nice. It was a nice escape for me. Well, let's talk about the film. I loved Dagger. I've watched it Thank three you. times already. <laughs> I, I've been picking up- So a, you're the three views. I, oh, listen, you have more views than that. I, we'll get into all this, like these little subtle things that you look at while you watch the film. But take me, how did the film come about for you to do and how'd you come up with the idea, Will? Well, so I've been wanting to uh, direct, guest direct television for a, a while now, since I've been doing more. And Nashville was really where I was like, oh, man, I, I could do this. I, I didn't know much about, I, I, knew, I knew enough about lenses and cameras and things like that. But I didn't, uh, but it, guest directing in television is its own little animal. Um, because in television, you have a guest director pretty much every episode. It's not the same director, depending on the show. But on a network show that does 18, 20 episodes, you have a guest director. And so I thought, you know, I could do that. Anyway, I talked about it for a long time, but never really put any effort uh, into it. Uh, and then uh, Ingrid and I shot um, the Tiger King parody. Uh, because someone had reached, I think Andrew Lipper reached out to her and was like, let's write a Tiger 
King musical parody. So we did that. And that day that we shot and the day before, I had so much fun doing prep and filming it. I thought, okay, Will, time to get off your ass and learn to think. You know a lot. There's a lot you don't know. So I started giving myself uh, film school pretty much every day for about four months in our house. Uh, I uh, employed the services of uh, my good friend, Don Scardino, wonderful theater director and television director, producer. We're good friends. Eric Stoltz is another person. They kind of mentored me, gave me assignments. I mean, literally like Don would say, here's an episode of, um, of New Amsterdam I directed, turn down the sound, count the shots, you know, things like that. Why does the camera move? Why does the camera not move? Um, then I started going, oh, I need to talk to everybody I could. I talked to uh, Ingrid's cohort, um, uh, for the notebook, Becca Brunstetter, who is a wonderful writer. She, you know, writes for, uh, wrote for This Is Us and, uh, gosh, American Monster, stuff like that. And I, just to, what's it like when a guest director comes on, stuff like that? Everybody without fail said, write and direct a short film. And I thought, that sounds like a horrible idea. I have no desire to, I'm not a writer. And a short film, that sounds pretentious. So then I'm not joking. So I had been in these assignments, I'd been doing. <laughs> these assignments where I was doing coverage of me, I'd set up the camera and these assignments I did, I was doing the to be or not to be speech. Yeah. Cause I've been doing the to be or not to be speech in many apartments across the world and uh, audition rooms across the world for the last 25 years. So uh, I, I started, I sat down to start to write this film and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if this guy is doing to be or not to be, and not this guy is like doing a recitation. He, we don't know, is he Hamlet? Is it a modern day Hamlet? And this voice in his head says, hold on a second. And it's Shakespeare. I think I think the seed of it probably is probably a bit of something rotten, the, the remnants of something rotten that's still in my blood and veins. Uh, but I thought, what would Shakespeare think of this guy doing this and the pretense of it? And, and I'm not joking, and I hate it when writers say this and I'm not one, say, oh, then it just wrote itself. But it kind of did. I'm not joking, I wrote it in one day. <laughs> I, I wrote it one day, the voice that kept popping in my head for Shakespeare uh, was Jack Davenport. I called him, I said, hey, I've written a screenplay for a short film. You wanna do it? Uh, he read it and was like, I haven't, and he has a lion's share of monologues and stuff, as you know. He said, I haven't done this much acting in a long time. So he said yes, and then then it was born out of that. Then I poured myself into literally doing it by the book, calling, I called SAG. I made sure that I was, you know, uh, cause I wanted it to be a real film to put out in the world. I, I, um, I, I had to light the thing. I had to shoot the thing. It was the hardest yet most rewarding thing I think I've ever done professionally, honestly. Okay, so let's talk about how do you describe what the film is? <laughs> it's, you. Making, it's making fun of Shakespeare. No, go ahead, yeah. No, because watching it, I said, oh, maybe he's an actor who has is taking on this role and is like, can't get the speeches down. But then you look at the little table that's next to you and you see what's on there. Yeah. So I, here's the thing. I wanted yeah. to, I, when I wrote it, I didn't want it to be an actor doing some Shakespeare and Shakespeare interrupts. I wanted, and I wanted to have both fun with the, the medium, meaning Oh, when we find this room and it's real, I, and when I was shot it, I wanted it to feel real. And in that moment, it is. This room is in uh, disarray. This man is at the end of his rope. I mean, he really is, as you find out through the movie, this man is contemplating killing himself. And, um, and so the music is epic at the beginning. It's this long one, one or tracking shot to me. The, the sound is even kind of reverby and my editor did the amazing job. And then all of a sudden he's interrupted by Shakespeare going, hold on. You know, look, you, if you're gonna do this, fine. Just don't use my words to do it. So I wanted to flip it on its head, be that kind of Ricky Gervais kind of English kind of, ooh, sorry, is there someone here? And we never see him. It's eventually in the light, you know, this chandelier that Ingrid, by the way, wants to get rid of in the house. Oh so, no, keep that. Cause I'll tell now, you- By the way, this is all shot in my guest room, in our guest room in our house. It's all shot other than the outside stuff. Anyway. So I wanted to have fun with the medium. And then I wanted to tell this story about, you know, um, we all need a little nudge from time to time. I I don't personally personally deal with anxiety, depression like this, but I'm very close to some people in throughout my life uh, who have. So I know I speak uh, to it from firsthand knowledge of this feeling of, you know, um, it, it's, it, it's certainly not my fault or the person's fault, there are some things I can do by myself. There's some things I can't. Some days are crappy. 
Some days aren't. So it was this kind of questioning. I didn't want to also didn't want to tie it up to this neat little and everything's great now in the world because it's it's not. The next day is another thing, but that's OK. The next day is another thing, but that's OK. That's kind of the, the message I wanted to send that we need a little nudge sometimes from either friends or from Shakespeare <laughs> or from a disembodied voice <laughs> and that we do have the power within. Uh, and I don't mean to make light of it or like, oh, you can do it yourself. Come on, stiff upper lip. But there is something that we do, some resolve that we do have, and especially during all the crazy crap and wildness that's going on in our world, I really just wanted to go, you know, um, you're not alone. And you're not, you know, this guy thinks he's alone and he's certainly not. And so I wanted to both have fun and to do something a little serious. Well, it's a perfect film for this time period because everyone I've spoken through during this pandemic said, Richard, I have real, especially early on, I have really good days and I have really bad days where they're like, can we do this an hour later? Because I just cried for an hour, they tell me, you know, and it's like everyone's going through their own thing and it's different if people are living alone. So your character starts off, you have no idea if there's someone else in his life. Which I think yeah, is I, you know, I even a friend of mine watched it was like, I like how half the bed is made and half isn't. Is that by design? I was like, everything pretty much is on uh, pretty much is on purpose. I mean, I, I again, if you pick that up, if you don't. Yes, he's he, he's uh, he is truly alone. We don't know why. And that, that's the other thing I've learned about short films and things. Um, you can get away with the narrative starting in the middle of a moment. And we don't have to explain, every, you know, in it in 22 minutes, which is long for a short film, by the way. Um, but in 22 minutes, you don't have to get an entire backstory. Did his wife leave him or his lover leave him? Or is he, you know, all this stuff we're in the, we thrust into this moment. And I think that's what makes this, and I'm new to, again, new to even watching now I've you know, probably watched every short film on the planet, but it's uh, unbelievable what people can do and are putting out there in the world. But you're exactly right. This is a surreal time for me to do it too, because we were, you know, this is like April, May, June. This was in the thick of George Floyd and sadness and co in LA, Kobe, you know, in January. And it was this weird thing where I, I, I was doing this thing for all day, every day, for a long time, for three weeks. And then I'd finish my day and come into the living room and watch TV and be devastated. And I thought, okay, you can either, you can either, it was, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to um, ignore it, you know, cause we, we did the whole, we did the, uh, the seminars with the um, Broadway for Black Lives Matter thing. You know, I, we took time out for that, but I thought if I don't compartmentalize and do this other thing, I'm, I'll be sad and go crazy. Um, so, you know, I, and I know I'm very fortunate and privileged to be able to even get to do that, obviously. And, but Ingrid kept me really grounded. Uh, the world kept me grounded and uh, my desire to learn something and do something new kept me grounded. But it was a real, as you said, it was, it's, believe me, it's not been surreal and hard for me uh, like it has been for some people with the pandemic and the social injustice and all that. But I did, you know, I, I just, I knew I'd go crazy if I didn't do this thing and then, you know, put it out in the world and see what happened. Well, like I said, it's wonderful. Let's go back to Don Scardino and Eric Stoltz. Sure. I knew Don as an actor first. I saw him in Godspell, I saw him in the musical <laughs> Angel, and King of Hearts, and then of oh, course my God. Playwrights Horizon, and then he became sure. a huge director on television and you know, film too, and Eric too. How did you know both of them? Well, Don directed Lennon. Don directed Lennon. Yeah. yeah. And and then Don and I have just stayed in yeah. touch. I mean, we'll text each other, you know, if something good or bad or what happens in the world, or he does these amazing guitar. He writes throughout the end of this Trump thing. He's been, he's, excuse me, as I burp, he's been, uh, he's been writing these kind of, you know, Don's an old, Don's a great folk hippie guy. And so he writes these great songs that are poignant, funny, whatever. So Don and I talked, I wrote him. I, after, after we shot Tiger King, I literally the next day I go, okay, Don, I'm going to get off my ass. Do, yeah. do you, do you want to help me do this? Like, I don't even know what this is, but I, I want to direct some television. So he was like, yeah, man. And we talked and, and Don's old school. Don directed, you know, the first season of freaking Law and Order, where he told me he's like, "Yeah, we just grabbed a 32 millimeter lens and a handheld and did it." You know, Eric uh, directed uh, some episodes of uh, Nashville, and of course, I I knew who he was. And then he's become this television director, and he's the funniest, quirkiest, 
coolest guy. I reached out to him and he and he approaches everything very filmically because he comes from the film world. So he was having me read, you know, Sidney Lumet's book and and Walter Murch editing book and say, watch, you know, I'm literally giving me assignments. You got to watch this Billy Wilder film. You got, you know, Bethany Rooney, another great, wonderful television director. I don't know if you know who she is, but we did some nationals together. She wrote this great book for directors who want to direct television. So I started reaching out to all these people and saying, learn me some stuff, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Learn me some, or just what, you know, one, what's it like, could I guess direct? And they're all like, yeah, you could guess direct. What What should I, how do I prepare? And Bethany has a book and yeah. everybody gave me, Becca gave me a writer's perspective and things like that. But Don and Eric were great and still are. I mean, I reach out to them. Like I said, the more you learn about this stuff, uh, the less you know, because you're like, oh, I, I talk to Don now about cameras. Don doesn't really, I mean, he knows lenses, but I'm like, yeah, I got a black magic uh, cinema camera. And he's like, eh, I don't know about digital, you know. And, <laughs> and, Is that what you um, shot it on the camera behind you? No. Okay. Okay. What so, is that an iPhone? That's a 12. I shot on the 11 Pro because it's all I had. Wow. And I now I bought some lenses for it. I had I had a I had it several dollies. There's the bath bathtub scene. Ooh, bathtub scene. Oh yeah. Bathtub scene. Oh, we we haven't talked about the most important person in all this. <laughs> Did you hear her? Ingrid, I was going to, I have to, we give the biggest shout out to Ingrid because I'll tell you, she did such a beautiful job. So what, yeah, collaborating. So, so, okay, together. so, so the, the phone was all I had. I'm not a camera person. I had some lights and things because I had done a bunch of self tapes and stuff. And the, the, the iPhone it, uh, Pro, especially 11 stuff, you know, Soderbergh shot several movies on yeah. the seven and stuff like that. So I knew that was done. Um, and a great app, I'll plug the app called Filmic Pro. It's great, it allows you to adjust exposure, stuff like that. I knew, and, and, and when I say I plotted out the shots, Bethany Rooney, the director, will be so proud of me because I, I really did it by the book. I, I wrote, I, I planned the shots. There was a psychology to them when, when it's static, when it moves, all this stuff. So I knew there was gonna have to be some movement. The first shot is an opening, and I'm not gonna go through shot, shot, shot by shot, so everybody calm down. But the, I knew I wanted this wonder to go into me. That's what, it ends up being an invisible cut. I did the camera work for that thing, and then it sweeps into me. We did like an invisible cut in editing. But Ingrid, she had to get up, and I, the room I shot this in, <laughs> I had I only had about a two hour window to shoot one way every day and a two hour window to shoot the other way because I was using mostly natural light. I had some other lights and things, but I had to use it. So the shot at the beginning when I'm looking through the curtain and stuff, that's the real 6.45 a.m. sun. She doesn't get up at 6.45. She, but the dolly shots that she does are, I'm not kidding. Yeah. And it's not like she knew how to do this. I taught her how to, you know, and then yeah. I wasn't the most easy person to work with. Really? I really wasn't because you know what? I, I knew that was the other part about us. I'm setting up all this stuff, doing all this. And then I thought, oh God, I've got to act in this. I Thank actually you. have to act in it. I learn line stuff. But I was, uh, I, if, she, if, if I could tell the camera was going, I was like, we have to do it again and watch it. And she got there. Some of my favorite shots in the film are Ingrid doing these dolly shots. Anyway, this is the, the iPhone was truly amazing. I couldn't have done some of the, like the bathroom shot is the phones under the, under the faucet. And she's got a little dolly that I bought a little that she's pulling across. I mean, if you saw the making of, um, but it's truly, um, I also, when I was doing this, I kept, you know, FaceTiming my, my daughter's going, there's no excuse for not doing anything. You can literally do anything with, with your phone and make, cause they both want to make films. Of, and, but it's true. I, I, it, it made me be inventive. There are some, yeah. you know, shots. I had a ladder on top of a ladder on top of a, you know, um, and then adding Jack to all of it. That was the other part. I recorded Jack before I shot one frame, but I couldn't use playback some. So I had to memorize the, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was truly, I'm not joking. The most rewarding thing I've done artistically and, and Ingrid, Ingrid, uh, besides grounding me during the process, she's in, uh, she's responsible for some of those great shots. <laughs> well, we have to give a big shot. You have so many Orson Welles and Hitchcockian shots of the light that she wants to get rid of in your guest room. You are not getting rid of that because if you do, well, like it's, that, yeah, when it well, it's, it's already sold. It's already sold <laughs> to a fan. No kidding. <laughs> to to um actually to Ashley Tisdale who. <laughs> Who owned who owned the house before we did? So she yeah. wants the she wants the light back.
But I'm telling you, when you don't know what that is, I said, oh, my God, I feel like there's like stalagmites or something out of a Superman movie. And then it turns, well, your, oh, that shot. How yeah. did you come up with that shot? For anybody, you got to watch this movie and then look at the first shot when well, you see that, that chandelier inspired the uh, the opening shot, which I tried to do several times on my own where I was trying to do the actual upside down. I had a gimbal and all that stuff. I thought I called a, a friend, uh, DP, and I said, hey, in post, can can they flip? And, and they said, yeah. And uh, Jan Clyer, my editor, who I have to give a shout out to. Big shout out. Did, Let's Yeah. Okay. Jan Clyer, amazing guy. I just found uh, by happenstance. He wow. did every all the post finishing, the sound design, all that stuff. Um, he, he took care of all that. And some of the footage I gave him was so, as we say, noisy, meaning there was so much... Um, the iPhone's great, but it, it's it's not the best great in low light and stuff like that. Anyway, he fixed a lot of the footage. And wow. then my composer. Let's talk uh, about him. I want that soundtrack. Saul Simon McWilliams, who uh, has produced Ingrid a lot. He was in her band for a long time. He and a guy named Dan Romer, they did Beasts of the Southern Wild. I mean, they're, they're composers in the business. I was like, hey, Saul... I didn't even ask him because I was like, this guy's too expensive and it's too, I'm doing this little film. Um, I said, can you not even point me in the right direction? Like, how do I send files to whoever ends up doing this? He goes, let me watch it. And he sent back the first day, not the final yeah. score, obviously, but he sent back some stuff. I thought, well, you get, you get the quirkiness, you get the seriousness. Cause I wanted this. I didn't want it to be, uh, we're pretending to be serious. I wanted it to be serious. And then I wanted it to be quirky. And it, yeah. And he, uh, it's the other star of the film for me. It's me, Jack, and the score. And Saul was just great. And we spent, that's the other part, post, uh, I finished shooting it in June. Uh, it was edited in uh, July and August. Saul finished the score in September and that was it. So it was a long, and that's 20 minutes. I'm, I'm floored by what, my newfound uh, respect and admiration is for these people that I've been on sets with over the last decade. I knew they were great, yeah, but the artistry and precision and expertise with which they work, and I'm nowhere near that, not pretending to be that. I have a brand new uh, respect for everything that goes into making an episode of television, but yeah. making a movie or something, it's, it's, it's phenomenal what these people do. I have a brand new respect to them. Well, For this sure. is your new world. This is your new yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't also didn't want to make a pandemic. You know, I didn't want yeah. to do a, yeah. a pandemic uh, where I'm wearing a mask. I'm alone. I wanted to at least make it artistic where there's a voice, and you know. And I love that it has a happy ending. I do too. But you know what? It's a happy ending, but it's not like For that all day. Is, yeah. All is, all is, it's, it is, it, it certainly is a happy ending, but it's not like all my troubles are good. I'm going back out in the world because oh, I've no. often, I've said this in a couple other interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, we need that nudge, but t t tomorrow you may need to sit in, in your stuff again. But know that you can get out. Know that you can get out. Listen, you know, we have to talk about Broadway because, like I said, it's been over 10 months since it shut down. And, you know, many people, Will, were supposed to make their Broadway debuts this spring. And then the pandemic came. And I hope and pray that when the theater comes back, they will be given that opportunity, which I think they will. Broadway debuts are really special. And yours, of course, was in Miss Saigon. I mean, playing Chris. Rich, it no. was not. My it, Broadway okay. debut was Wait. Rent. People was it forget. Really? So Rent, I'd oh. done Miss Saigon on the road. And then I then I was oh. a standby. I was a, a understudy for uh, Norbert and uh, Jim Pullis. So I was a Mark Roger cover first. Okay. And then about six months in, uh, I think it was Matt Bogart left Saigon, and then I went to do Saigon. Then had come, then I came back to rent like a few times. But that's a, uh, and I think people think this that you're not the only one. But yeah, because we've been down this road before. When I sat with you there that long, <laughs> you're like, Richard, it really wasn't that. It was the other thing. I didn't have time. It was rent. It was rent. I was, in fact, I, it, I was just talking about this with somebody the other day. We, I, we were on stage doing an understudy rehearsal, like my first week. Kevin McCollum was in the back talking to New York One about the raise in ticket prices from from uh, sixty uh, fifty five to eighty five dollars. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know, us going, Jonathan would be rolling over in his grave at 85. Now it's like, now they're seventeen hundred dollars. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just sit anywhere in the theater. <laughs> but anyway, yes. Uh, but but my Broadway debut was that, and it, it was absolutely special. I remember the hairs. I remember we that you know how the opening starts and it's all talking, and then uh, Mark goes, the power blows, and I was a squeegee man, so I was in my like, you know, I was a nervous wreck. It was January thirtieth. <laughs> Uh, it was January 30th, 1998. I remember it. And when he went to power blows and it went, two, three, go, bow, da, 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 da. every, I'm surprised my own hair, which was bleached at that time. Uh, I remember the exhilaration, the fear, but the joy and the loudness of like, oh my God, I'm in rent on yeah. Broadway. Are you kidding me? So to your point, it, it, it's truly the, I mean, you could, if Inger wasn't in the shower, we would ask her about um, about um, uh, Comet because that yeah. was, you know, she'd been dying to do this her whole life and then became a pop star. And then, yeah. you know, it's exhilarating. It truly is and saddens me that, like you said, people can't. Ugh. Was that whole uh, night surreal for you? Like when you heard that da 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 were, were you just like hearing different sounds or whatever? Or like, like, like what was your breath? Yeah, because you don't ever, as an understudy, you don't get a put in really yeah. with the band or anything. So just the band itself, you're looking over yeah. going, huh, they're amazing. <laughs> you know, like you're trying to go, okay, you have to, and then when I got to my Will I solo, again, nervous wreck, but you get to that top note and you're like, I'm on Broadway. I mean, seriously, it, it's truly exhilarating. Finishing it, and I get home, and my ex-wife Lori and I were very close. Lori, <laughs> I don't know if she still got the footage. She had standing room only in the back at, at the Nederlander. They had those, you know, you could stand in the back and see through those little like windowed things. window frames or whatever picture frames. She had an, a coach bag that she cut a hole in. And I'm seeing in these days, you know, it was like a little mini DVD. I mean, it was like, a, you know, a tape. She taped my Broadway debut. So, Lori, I'll text you later. But if you're listening, you know, we could put that out in the world. No, there's there's footage of me singing Will I. I'm sure it's like this. Yeah. But um, of her staying there and somebody coming by, you know, probably. Bag. But the there is footage. Yes, but please move your coach bag <laughs> off the railing, please. I oh, sorry. It's up there. I'm just going to hold it right there. Um, uh <laughs> But no, truly exhilarating, like you said. Absolutely. All right, but, all right, so then you move into Chris and Miss Saigon. I mean, now that's got to be interesting because, like you said, you had done the national tour and that had to blow your mind too. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start in rent and they're like, oh my gosh, now you're going to take over Chris in Miss Saigon. Do you yeah, remember it was. Performance on Broadway must have been much different than that first performance on the road. I, I, I honestly, I don't remember my first performance because it was so, that show was so in my blood. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm sure it was special. Um, and I'm sure I was allowed actually tickets as opposed to my wife standing in standing room, but- um, <laughs> her legal, With her legal <laughs> camera her, in her coach. Cameron uh, McIntosh, right. I'm sure Kevin Kevin McCollum now would be like, oh, sorry, we would have given you tickets, but- um, um, But uh, no, Miss, and Miss Saigon, you know, I did, uh, I, I ended up playing that role from doing the tour uh, two years on Broadway in the Philippines more than anybody ever. And if I weren't 50, it was one of those roles I still would, I, 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 I've often said, oh, I could still play that. Um, but I, it was one of those roles, obviously, that I loved or I wouldn't have done it for so long. But that was, you know, again, that Cameron McIntosh family and all of us guys at that time, the, the Matt Bogarts, the, yeah, we were, is he going to be Les Mis next? Is he going to play Phantom next? Is he going to, you know, um, I'm glad that I was out of that world a little bit. I'm glad that I, I started to do, you know, more of the Full Montes or the Aidas or the, uh, I love me some Cameron Macintosh, but I didn't get in that pigeonhole in that way, you know. No, it's just so interesting, though, because you say your Chris and Miss Saigon is sort of like your Yule Brenner in The King and I, Carol oh. Channing's Hello, Dolly. It's like, you know, how many performances did you do? Like, you must... You, you uh, 1,600. 1,600, yeah. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Well, that's insane. It's, that sounds insane to me right now. I was just talking to someone the other day yeah. going, because I, I get often asked if, if I miss theater. Uh yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, but no, doing it, <laughs> no. I mean, eight times a week is is maddening. It's so it hurts. It's hard. If I could teleport from my desk to uh, eight p.m. warmed up, stretched, made up, all that stuff, then I'd do it forever. But you can't because all you think about all day is my back, my you know all these things. Um, theaters for the young. Give right. me a, give me a role. Give me a give me a limited run play. I'm your man. Okay, because Kelly O'Hara was with me last week. And of course, okay. we 
We talked about you, of course, how wonderful it was. Everybody adores you. You know that, my friend. But, you know, we all talked a lot during Kiss Me, Kate. All of, I remember we all got together for my Broadway World SAG after. You guys are like, she said, I love Will. He's like, we're like a brother and sister. I mean, what was it like sharing the stage with Kelly and Kiss Me, Kate? Well, you know, because we had shared the stage a few times before yeah. that, obviously. Um, the time I really got to know her was doing Oklahoma in Oklahoma on the hundredth, you know, anniversary of the state or whatever. And it was the first time I, I knew she could sing and I knew she could act and all that stuff, but it was the first time I knew that she was funny. I mean, just not as the role, Lori's not funny, but <laughs> but Kelly was funny in rehearsal. I was like, oh, then we did Bells Are Ringing. And I've said this before, that was the first time I thought, oh, everybody else knows now that she's funny because people like Kelly O'Hara is that role. I can't, you know, and then she was funny. And then, of course, um, nice work and all that. So yeah. being in Kiss Me Kate, you know, and you're trying to do this thing, this piece in 2019. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time talking. Me and Scott, uh, Kelly, Scott and I spent a lot of time talking about we don't want to lose the comedy of this thing. We don't want to whitewash these moments, but we also need to tell. So it was this dance. I would get frustrated because Kelly and Scott, they could talk. I'm, I'm like, okay, so, you know, we have a preview in like three weeks and then like, okay, you know, we have a preview in two days. You guys are still talking, but, but to, uh, to their defense, we really had to hash that out. And then we were allowed to like have fun and being on stage with her. I, I trust no one more than Kelly on stage The things, the physical stuff we had to do and brother and sister stuff, the personal stuff that, you know, that you go through in, in, in a, a long run. Whatever it is, if it's, oh, my kids are pissed at me, or, oh, my back hurts, or, uh, d this happened in the world, you know, offstage, you can talk to this person, and you know they get you, and you can look at them on stage in a given moment, yeah. whether you're sad, or whatever it is, or you've had a tragedy, it almost makes me tear up, you can look to this person and go, and look at them, and they've got you, they've got your back, and I know other people are like that, but Kelly is like that in a, in a very, um, special and cool way where you you know now you have this shorthand of just like i got your back you got my back you know what i mean um and a fighter and loves to fight for you know things and i love that about her absolutely okay so we talked about physicality and she was like richard i can't even raise my arms more like this now my rotocuss because of those dresses and stuff like you two were so physical in that show and then you'd sing you know your big 11 o'clock number like how does Will get that stamina? And how does he not like walk off and like your back hurts? I would think your thighs would hurt, your hips would hurt. I mean, like alcohol, no. um, not necessarily untrue, but no. um, but, but that's no. after the show. Well, you never know. Oh, okay. Before so in love, maybe maybe a few times before so in love, but who's counting? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you, you know, it, we, uh, that's the eight eight times a week thing part of it. Yeah. On Monday or on Tuesday, Wednesday, you're like, this is great. By Friday, you're like, uh, okay, let's let's revamp. And Kelly, you talking about the shoulder? I mean, she screwed up her shoulder having to do all this stuff. Um, and my thing with choreography and fights and things, I hate it. I hate going to a show and watching a fight yeah. that looks choreographed or something. Now, it was weird in our show because we had choreographed fights as uh, as as Patricio and um, God help me, Patricio Kate. and Kate. Catherine. He's Kiss me, Kate. Shakespeare guy. Yeah, he's good. He knows it's Shakespeare. Um, and then we had our Fred and Lily fight that yeah. had, had to be real. And so, you know, we the the you know, I'd even get a whisper sometime, literally, as she's climbing, like getting ready to climb me, uh, hold me a little higher today, hold me, okay, you know, hold me a little higher, or my back shell, I can't go down to my knee, or you know, you're stepping on my foot, right, uh, you know, or my wig's caught in your oh, wig's caught in your button. So you get down from this thing, you're like, Ah, so there you go, Lily. You know, um, it, 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 but that said, it was so much fun and so rewarding. And, and hearing the audience, and again, you're doing this line of, is it violent? Is it funny? Is And knowing it's funny, you're like, okay, we got them. We got them. But I mean, I just, I don't know. Could you made it all look so real? I know it was choreographed. It had to be, but the two of you made this stuff look so real. I'm like, I have no idea how they got through that. Well, crazy don't either. thing that happened to you in that show. Was there a crazy, crazy thing that you were like in that show, like goes into your books is like, oh my gosh, this is what happened. Well, cra there's one crazy and one, I mean, uh, sad, but I'm over it now. Uh, crazy was Preston Boyd having to go on as a gangster at 15 minutes. Never rehearsed. This is early on. 
I think Lance had been out or something sick or got hurt on the way to the theater or something. Preston Boyd, one of my, I mean, like a hero, funniest, one of the funniest humans on the planet too. And gifted Preston, stop understanding. You're a leading man. Um, He had to go on as one of the gangsters. So he, he knew a lot of it. We ran it a little bit when I would come off stage and then he went book in hand for, uh, for, um, Brush up your Shakespeare. again, Shakespeare. Brush up your Shakespeare, and I thought you're the you're a badass. Like, and then of course he was on the next night, I think, and he was off book. But like that was like okay, and then uh, not sad. Oh, woe is me. This was one of the lowest points, to, <laughs> lowest points in my career. I had shot a pilot the previous September, so of 2018, of a Hulu show, <laughs> and uh, was pseudo starring in it but you know it was gonna make some money and it was gonna be this great deep heavy thing and two days before that they announced you know uh, uh hulu picks up uh this show they're picking it up and my people called and said this is great you know don't don't count your chickens out because they send what's called a an intent letter you know and all that stuff. i'm not joking i went to fight call at 7 15 on a thursday night and came back upstairs to text from my manager and a text from a producer on the TV show saying, Will, thank you so much. We're so, we, they had to make some changes. So I hadn't heard anything. I'm reading yeah. this text from the producer. I call Anthony, my manager, immediately going, I think I've just been fired. He goes, let me, hold on. Because he was in Paris. <laughs> like, it was this weird thing. He called, he said, uh, they're not picking up your option. They're replacing you. Now I've had this happen to friends. I've read about it. I uh, I was devastated. I was li- I was I was devastated. I uh, I went down to stage management. I'm not embarrassed now to talk about it, but I went down to stage manager. I grabbed Preston on the way. I said I'm totally fine to do the show. I said I don't want to do the show right now. I said um, I'm sorry if this puts everybody out. Preston, can you do it? Yes. Are you guys cool if Preston does it? If, if Preston does the show, if not, I'll go out and do the show. I'm I, I'm a big boy. I can do it. But and I was in tears. I I, I was devastated. Um, it's the first time I've ever shared this with anybody professionally. Uh, and uh, and they said totally fine, totally fine. I remember going upstairs. My dresser David was just in tears with me. I walked out on the street. It was like a surreal kind of weird yeah. thing. I got in the cab. Scott Ellis calls me, and Scott comes from the TV, or comes from theater, but he obviously big in the TV world too. He goes, Will, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not. He goes, don't apologize, go home, have scotch, cry. It's horrible, it's the worst thing. It probably had nothing to do with, you know, with because you meet you, you think I'm the worst actor in the world. Why don't they love me? Um, and, uh, but it, that was one of those real moments that, so coming back the next day, Kelly, that's one of those moments where I got gotcha. you. She knows the business, she knows the world, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the, the, they're doing different casting. They eventually changed where they were shooting and half the cast got replaced. But um, in that moment, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely horrible professionally. And um, so people have my back, Scott and Kelly, and because they're real, they, they know, and everybody in the cast. Preston, oh my God, Preston was like, dude, I don't even know what I do. And you don't, too. You, and I've had friends, you know, I've had friends replaced at a table read. Like yes. they did the table read of a pilot and they're like, Ooh, yeah, we're, repl-, you know, it's like the, the worst, but anyway, um, what a bummer to end on. So Preston, Preston going on as, <laughs> as a gangster. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, no, I think, listen, I thank you for sharing that because everyone goes through this stuff. And I know the TV series you that they replaced you in was a big bomb anyway. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, 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 but I just think, thank you for sharing that because everyone goes through this. Stars go through this all the sure. time. And fans watching this around the world can be like, oh, I love Will even more. Oh, well. No, I you know what so. I mean? It's just like, you know, sure. you're, you're a human being. Sure. You're not a machine. I mean, you have feelings too. It's like the last thing you wanted to do after hearing that two seconds for you going on, like, you know. Well, and, you know, my girls asked me t- t- yeah. at this point too, do you still get disappointed? I, I, yeah. With auditions and stuff, not really because I know how the, I know how it works. I didn't get the job because I didn't get the job or whatever. But that one was a new one, you know, and that one was tears and disappointment and something I wanted to do and something that would have probably changed my career. I'm not a reason person. I'm not, oh, there was, you know, but 
you know, would have changed my career for the better. Would I would have made a lot of money. I would have been able to do whatever. So it was a very disappointing thing. But you know, I made it through it, and I'm doing other things. And listen, you, know. you you have done so much incredible work on television. I mean, uh, you, thanks. You know, we have love it. Smash for a minute because I mean, Smash was one of those shows. How do you look at it now? Because Smash has this incredible cult following. I mean, it's amazing how people have have just. A lot of people watch that show the first time around more than everybody gives it credit for. But I'm like, yeah. how, how do you view this? How did you view the show then? How do you view it now? Was it maybe one of the first hate watch? Remember that phrase? Yeah, totally. hate watch sure. shows? Yeah. I think it was. Um, viewing it then, that was amazing to be on because you're like, oh my God, I'm, I, we're doing my world. We're doing our world. Yeah. Like Christian Burl and I'd be like pinching ourselves going, this is our world, you know? Um, uh, and then it was my first real stab at really doing television. I had done some television, but this was like, oh, it's a substantial role. You're going to be on it. Um, uh, you know, of course I met Deborah and we dated for a while. So that was great. Um, uh, and I made some lifelong friends with Jack and Christian and things like that. There was a, a pressure on us on that show yeah. to make it really, there was a pressure from NBC because it was precious. Then there was also pressure from the theater community because that doesn't happen. And you're like, well, it's, it's 42 minutes really of an hour program on, on, yeah. Network television is really 42 minutes. We have 42 minutes. I can't really, we can't, you know, really do a rehearsal because yeah. that would be uh, boring and sweaty. So we have to make these, you know, people dance and they got it the first time. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I think the show is hit or miss. The I think the scripts were kind of hit or miss, meaning what, what are the rules? Can we sing? Can we not sing? Oh, we can't. Oh, uh, is it just practical singing at rehearsal? No, all of a sudden I'm singing to someone in the street. Um, I think that was a little flimsy for me. I think they worked it out eventually. Um, I think as I look back now, it's like, I think it's really, I think it really stands up. I think it was really yeah. cool. I think it launched, you know, I think it launched Megan and, and, and Christian into the world that didn't know who these people kind of were working with um, Angelica and Deborah, you know, two of the, biggest names ever, but also the most like consummate, cool professionals on set. You know, there was never, okay, you ready? Okay. You know, there were, ne there was never moments that you're right. expecting from, you know, <laughs> the, the dame. Right. No, they were chill and cool. And we had, so, are you kidding? Those days where we were doing the, the, the workshop when everybody on in the cast is in this studio, you got Brian Darcy James, who, the best voice in the world uh, i don't think sings sings once ever but you've got everybody watching you've got us doing the show those are the, some of the most fun times where i could just look sideways at christian borrell he'll laugh if he's watching this he'll know what that means and we have to cut because that would be we've ruined a take and um and uh but one of our dear friends uh uh jeff molstock a wonderful camera operator slash uh, director DP, who's also helped me a lot in this. Um, he's one of those people that taught me a lot about just, hey, Will, if you, and Christian tells this story too, if you just stand two inches to the left, I've got you, I've got her, I've got the light, I've got the thing. I'm like, oh, this is cool, you know. So that was, and, and again, that was my launching into doing more television, but I think Smash totally stands the, t I, think, I think it stands up better now than then, because I think everybody was ready to yeah. hate that show yeah but talking about cool you got to play luke wheeler on nashville i mean a country western star i mean that had to be cool. an amazing thing right that was so cool because it was <laughs> you know started as a recurring christian Borle put me on tape in his apartment and then uh they wrote back saying we love him we wanted to sing and we what can we see him sing so then uh they deborah and i were dating at the time deborah put me on tape with my guitar in, in her apartment, like kind of moving it around. It was like, it's its own like movie. And then they were like, yeah, this is great. And then that, you know, it became a series regular. Uh, it That was the coolest, the, op the opposite of Smash, meaning the set was really relaxed and chill. Uh, Video Village was really relaxed and chill. You didn't really feel ABC over there going, what's going on? We had a lot of fun. It shot in Nashville. So I got to see my parents all the time. Uh, I met, uh, I knew I knew who Ingrid was and stuff, and we had met earlier. But during that time, she had been riding down there, and uh, so it, it was a that was and getting to play that character, getting to sing and perform. Those days where we performed, I was like in heaven because I'm like, this is this is where I live. You know, it was great. It was fun, a lot of fun, so much fun. That is great. You know, talking about you know, you mentioned about Broadway. You know, um, you always go away to do TV series and everything else, but you always come back to Broadway. 
Well, Tell me why. if someone again, if <laughs> someone writes me a play, uh, because you know, there's that, and and I and I it, seriously, I, I don't miss it in terms of. It's weird to say. Yeah. I never thought I'd say it. I don't miss that eight thing a week, especially with singing. People don't. Uh, you don't understand how hard it is to do musical theater. I'm blessed to get to do it, and I know that there are worse jobs to have. But yeah. it's a really hard athletic thing that my colleagues do, especially, you know, and I'm sitting there, Kelly and I would joke. <laughs> We'd joke and kiss me, Kate, like, should we be getting the last bow? These three were tumbling and, and doing flips. And and James was doing uh, oh. some, uh, not some like it hot, um, uh, too darn hot. And I mean, that that piece, sorry, sorry. But that was yeah. easily the best, sorry, best choreographed moment in theater in a long time. But um, uh, they're athletes. They're they're you know you 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 play hurt. You do all these things. Yeah. You you sacrifice relationship. You sacrifice family. You sacrifice sacrifice sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, I do not miss that. However, if someone were to write me, a, but the joy of getting uh, the joy of getting that feedback and la especially comedies, which is hard to do, but uh, it's there's nothing absolutely nothing like that in the studio. Yeah, yeah your you, your castmates laugh at you the first week. The second week they're worried about their own stuff. Third week we're like, can we please get out of here? And you're trying to deliver this joke, and it's like, and Scott's going, well, that's not funny. It's not funny, is it? It's not funny. And then you get in front of an audience, you're like, oh god, it's funny. Okay, good. See? You know what I mean? And night after night, and so that that is its own reward. I mean, there's no drug like that in the world. Well, we have to get you back on Broadway in a play because I remember talking to like Jeremy Jordan and Matthew Morrison, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, it's so different! It's like the warm up so different. You have to you don't have to worry about singing, and it's a whole other set of tools you use." Oh yeah, Pasquale, Pasquale, and I always fight. Yeah, yeah. It's like and Steven, if I'm doing a musical, he's doing a play, or it's like, dude, I'll tra I'll trade you in a heartbeat. I mean, I have to, sorry, I have to say this too, just on the record, his performance in Bridges. Oh yeah. Sorry, how did he not? Don't get me started on the Tonys, but no. how did he not? Best vocal performance I've heard. Not win everything. Like the Ben Platts of of Dear Evan Hansen, the like those performances, those vocal performances. Yeah. That 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 uh, Pasquale performance for me was like not that I'm. Uh, sometimes I go like if I see Danny Burstein, I go, uh, I'm giving up acting because he's so great. Yeah. Stephen is one of those where I'm like, oh, I'm never singing again because who can sing like that? Um, anyway. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It, the, the the play thing, like, yeah, I don't have to what I don't have to sing. I can do this with the whole show with a Ricola in my mouth. Sign me up. It's like I can go out for a beer afterwards, which I can't do when I'm in a musical. It's like you know, it's that sort of thing. It's like a whole different thing about getting there. As, you know. Yeah, but I'm over that. I'm I'm of the age now. It's like yeah, I'll go out. Yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a few scotches. Good for you. Well, it warms you up afterwards. All the great stars used to do that. The Jason Robards, all these great people. You know, <laughs> this hour has, I, I adore you. You know, hour? I oh God, hour. <laughs> totally. I hope you weren't supposed to be somewhere. I'm not be somewhere, but maybe another, maybe another Zoom, but not an interview. So Trevor, if you're watching this in three days, sorry. <laughs> sorry about this. Listen, the the film is Dagger. You can watch it on Vimeo. It is absolutely terrific. Like I said, I have known you since one of your debuts. I think I've known you from your <laughs> debut. I think, I think you are correct. Which is Miss Saigon. I love what's happened to your careers. Everything you have Thanks, done, God. you know, I cannot wait to see you in person, actually give you a hug. That would be amazing to me. I would love that. I would welcome that. I will see you soon. Everybody stay safe. Wear a mask. We are almost there and we'll see you soon. Take care.